أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ويسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to help us recognize the truth and help us follow it and to help us recognize the falsehood and help us avoid it ويسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to make the best of our deeds the last ones that we do and the best of our days the day that we shall meet him السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Imam Hassan al-Banna said something really beautiful in one of his 20 principles he said Islam liberates the minds, and Islam encourages every person to pursue that which is useful and raises into high ranks knowledge and those that have the knowledge. And he mentioned at the end a statement, some believe it to be hadith or an athar, the wisdom is the goal of the believer, wherever he finds it, he's most deserving of it. So Islam liberates the mind. The expression blind faith does not come from Islam actually. Quite the opposite. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kul hadihi sabili, ad'u ila Allahi ala basira ana wa man attaba'ani. So this is my path. I call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with clarity, myself and those that follow me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, inna ma yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al-ulama'u. That those that fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among his servants are those that have knowledge. And also Allah says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah raises those among you that have knowledge and even into high status. Actually, the scholars believe that ilm or knowledge comes even before iman, before the emotional iman, so to speak. Uh, why is that? Because the emotional iman is very biased. Each person from different faith, they will tell you that I believe that what I have is the truth. So the emotions led each person to a different conclusion. Each will tell you that what I have is the truth because I feel it, because it clicks with me, because something touches me or whatever. But actually need something that is more objective than that. You cannot depend on feelings because obviously feelings let people into different conclusions. That's why there had to be something that is less biased and more objective. That's why the beginning was Iqra, read in the name of your Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls in the beginning to lead or to acquire or to pursue actually any, any knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages even to go beyond, beyond that. Now the, the person's fitra or the person's human nature normally will lead the person into knowing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person's pure nature will lead him into a belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, when interacting with a material world and different things that we kept getting bombarded with, then this fitra, this human nature, does not keep or maintain its purity. That's why we start asking for a proof. We start asking for something that proves to us that Allah exists. We start asking for indicators about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and here comes the role of the mind. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in many places says, think, ponder. You know, let the person look from what he was created. Let the person look at his food. It doesn't mean, of course, he's just looking or watching it, but looking and pondering about it, watching that or looking about thinking about that food. You know, how does it start? How does it end? How everything actually goes into different places in the body. And you come to the conclusion that there is actually a Lord beyond this universe. There's an interesting actually uh, uh, story about a verse or a couple of verses in Surah uh, Al-Mu'minun. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and the Prophet alayhi wasalam, was dictating to Hudayf ibn al-Yaman one of the uh, people that wrote the revelation for him. So the Prophet was dictating to Hudayfa, reading, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses describes the creation that we created from this and then the bones and the flesh and the Prophet stopped alayhi salatu was salam. Then Hudayf ibn al-Yaman thought for a second and he said, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ That glory be to Allah, the best of the creators. And the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam smiled and he said to him, اُكْتُبْهَا فَهَكَذَا نَزَلَتْ Write it down, that's how it was revealed. Which means that the person thinks about that. So Hudayf said it before he knew that it was actually part of the Quran, part of the revelation. Which means that the last part is the natural conclusion of anyone that thinks and ponder. So if you want to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let your mind actually do the job. And the conclusion will be in your heart. And this mind 
as great and as powerful as it is, and as important of a tool as it is, has its own limitations. So it is not something that the mind can go without any, any limits or without any guidelines. And I think out of respect to the mind is to know what the mind can and what the mind cannot. There are certain things that the mind can answer and certain things that the answer actually cannot. And this is true, by the way, about everything about ourselves, even our senses. If you think about that, the obvious thing is that our senses have limitations, right? I mean, our eyes don't show us everything that's in there. What you see is accurate, but you don't see everything that's in there. There are certain things of a certain magnifications, certain wavelengths that our eyes do not show us. And the same thing when it comes to our hearing. You don't hear everything that's in there, that's out there. What you hear is accurate normally, unless the person, of course, has problems. But normally, you don't hear everything that's out there. And so the mind also has limitations. As rich and as powerful as our imagination can be, our imaginations have limitations. They cannot go around imagining something that they have not experienced. It's like somebody who has never seen colors all of his life, and you talk about them about the notions of color. That's why the mind, as powerful as it is, has limitations, and we have to acknowledge the fact that there are limitations. So things that the mind has not experienced, the mind cannot imagine. So when it comes to matters of ghayb, of the unseen, there are certain things where the mind actually stops. You know, the word around us, or existence, if you were to go broad, broader than that, is part shahada and part ghayb, part seen or experienced firsthand, directly through senses, and part unknown to us or unperceived directly. For example, tomorrow is a ghayb today. Uh, what's happening in China is a ghayb for us. In the hereafter, that's a ghayb. The word of angels, that's a ghayb. What I'm seeing is a shahada. Some of the ghayb can become a shahada. You know, tomorrow becomes, which is a ghayb, becomes a shahada once you're there. Uh, if you go somewhere, it becomes a shahada. But there are certain aspects of the ghayb that remain as such until the person again goes in there. Matters related to uh, belief, to aqidah, the angels, the jinns, the day of judgment, the self of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are all ghayb. And here the mind cannot tell me actually what's out there. So how do I know then what's out there? That information has to be given to us. So yes, Islam liberates the mind, but Islam also tells us to acknowledge the fact that the mind has limitations, that there are certain things that my mind actually cannot answer. Certain questions have to be answered for me. I cannot answer them on my own. What is the purpose of my existence? Who created me? What's out there? What's my relationship to him? Is there anything beyond in there? How do I get there? These are answers, these are questions that have to be answered for me. My mind cannot answer them on my own. Now, what is the job of my mind in that regard? My mind actually can help me understand what they are. First, verify the trustworthiness of the source. That's why if I trust that it's coming from me from someone who is sadiq and ameen, that these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I accept everything that comes with it. As strongly as if I've seen it. You know, none of us have lived, I think, through World War I and World War II, right? Anybody's been through any of these two? Well, I can't see you anyway. <laughs> but yet we believe that they exist very strongly, just as strongly as we believe that the events that are happening in Syria or Egypt are going on right now. Why do we believe in that? Because it came through us through trustworthy source of information. And the same thing, we can believe in the hereafter as strongly as we believe in this word, in a different way though, of course, because we have not perceived it directly if we accept the trustworthiness of the source. So if it comes to us through a trustworthy of the source, then I would accept and it becomes a belief for me. So here the job of the mind is to verify the credibility of the source and to understand the ghayb, but not to discover the ghayb on its own because our mind will not be able to discover it on its own. So the job of the mind is to understand actually what that is given to us. And this, by the way, applies to everybody. So nobody, can discover these things on their own, not even Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him in the Quran, that he found you looking for direction and he guided you. So that was given even to Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even told him in Surah Al-Shura, 
ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء. That you did not know what Iman is or what the book, but we guide whoever we wish with it. So even Prophet Muhammad والسلام, would not have been able to have these information on his own had they not been given to him. So if that is the Prophet والسلام, then what about us? Now why am I saying that? That's obvious, right? Because sometimes we think our mind can answer all the questions. I don't need anybody and my mind can help me balance everything to know whether it actually is true or not. So our, the job of the mind is to verify the validity of the source and also to accept them. Because as Ibn Taymiyyah said, the revelation came with something that brought something that the mind cannot discover on its own, but yet the mind cannot reject. What does that mean? So certain things the mind cannot discover on its own, but yet the mind can tell you whether it's logical or not. So the mind can tell you whether this is something that makes sense or not. So if something brings two contradicting elements in there, you can tell that they're not valid. And here, the mind actually can answer this question. And also, among the limitations of the mind, is that the mind does not, by necessity, lead to Iman. It's one of the ways, it's one of the causes that lead into that effect. So in other words, if the person is educated and smart, it doesn't mean that automatically, I'm gonna be a strong believer. Now we know for a fact that this is not the case because not all the intelligent people actually are believers. Then what's, what's the job in here? What's the story in here? The biggest cause is that it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put causes for every effect. And among the causes is the mind. Among the road that lead into that effect is the mind. But it doesn't mean it comes by necessity because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that there are certain people that adallahu ala ilm, that he misguided him with the knowledge that he has or through the knowledge that he has. Because that knowledge sometimes can become a road to arrogance and that blinds the person. So belief comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the hadith al-Qudsi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi kullukum dalun illa man hadaytuh, fastahduni ahdikum. That all my servants, all of you are stray, except the ones that I guide, so seek my guidance and I will give it to you. So if you want that belief, then this is the way to seek it. But through the knowledge or through the mind, and after that, coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Among the limitations of the mind is when the person attempts to know the guidelines of what's right, what's wrong, yes, but also more than that, sometimes what's halal and what is haram. Only based on what the mind has, disregarding everything else. Of course, the mind, by the way, the aql and the mantik and the logic is one of the tools of knowing the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this sharia. But the mind cannot exist on its own. In other words, added to that is the other kind of knowledge that will help actually guide the mind. Like for example, somebody saying, well, uh, let's move Jumu'ah to Sunday. It's more practical this way. And we analyze it because, you know, Jumu'ah is meant to bring people together. Jumu'ah is something where people actually can focus on the prayer and they will do it better actually on Sunday. Makes sense? Or why do we pray five times a day? You know, when the days are long, we can probably pray six. When the days are short, we can probably pray four or three. The mind makes sense, right? I mean, if you think of worship as something that you have to space, you know, throughout the day, then it makes sense to pray more when the days are long and to pray less when the days actually are short. This is what the mind does. Of course, it doesn't make any sense because here we're talking about ibadat, about acts of worship. And as Imam al-Banna also said, that the essence of the worship is the worship itself. So here, the person cannot say just, well, my mind tells me that. Now, of course, this is obvious. We don't do these things, but sometimes we do something that is not actually far from that, where people actually started saying, I don't think this should be halal. I don't think this should be haram. And just based on an opinion, disregarding the fact that there could be an element actually of shara in that in that regard. I think we should observe that occasion. We should not celebrate this. We should not celebrate that. This should not be haram, should not be haram. You know, imagine, for example, somebody who's a physician posting Facebook something, a piece of advice, a piece of medical advice. 
how to uh, do certain things, and this will be good for the blood pressure. And he goes into presenting some technical information. And then some brothers and some sisters, without having that proper background, commenting and saying, I disagree with this, I agree with that. It happens, wallahi, it happens. And of course, the physician feels really aggravated. This is technical information in there. You can comment and you can give your opinion. It's not a privilege of anybody, but only provided that you have the proper background to give such an inf information or such a feedback, especially that many people actually are reading and they may get confused and he will feel frustrated. How could they do that? But yet that same person may go actually writing or giving information or giving opinion about certain halal and haram. My opinion is this, my opinion is that. The same thing. Now here again, I'm not saying that ilm is a privilege of anybody. Anyone, it's available to everybody, provided that the person actually has the proper background and the proper tool to give such information. That's why the mind here has limitation. I cannot just depend on my own analysis. That's why Ali bin Abi Talib said that if matters were left to opinions, then when people wipe over their khuf, they should wipe at the bottom, not at the top. You know, excuse me, you know that when a person actually has wudu, they can wipe over their khuf or their socks or their jurmuk, depending you know, on the different opinions. And when you wipe, you wipe over the top. But the part that gets dirty is the bottom. So Ali said, if it's up to opinions, people would wipe over the bottom. But we know that we wipe over the top. I think the important lesson in here is that sometimes you cannot just depend on opinion. And here the mind has to be limited. Has to, has, we have to acknowledge the fact that the mind has limitation and not to give it basically a free permission to roam whatever we want. It's available to everybody provided that the guidelines actually are, are observed. So the mind, my brothers and sisters, is a very powerful tool to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his existence, about his greatness, to measure things, to understand the religion. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguished the human being from the other creatures with the ability to think, the ability to ponder. And the more the person thinks, the more humble he becomes. The closer he becomes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's why the beginning was iqra, read. But also that mind cannot go anywhere, cannot go everywhere. There are certain limitations, and if the mind is not guided, the mind can lead into destructive conclusions, into inventing certain things that will be destructive, or into misguiding the person who may have a smart mind, that's why the beginning was Iqra bismi rabbika. Read in the name of your Lord. This knowledge has to be acquired, but has to be acquired seeking a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for the person to be humbled and in order for the mind to come to the right conclusion. Jazakumullah khair. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.